Hello and welcome to the Machine Ethics Podcast. This time I had the great pleasure to talk to Mark Kuckelberg. This episode was recorded on the 7th of November 2022. We chatted about AI as a story about machines and where we're heading with creating human level intelligence, moral standing and robot animal interfaces, technology determinism, environmental impacts of robots and AI progress and energy budgets in business, politics of AI and political technologies, as well as Mark's new book on the politics of AI, the delicate balance of governmental and industry self-regulation and global governance for global issues. If you'd like to find more episodes, you can find them at machine-ethics.net or you can contact us at hello at machine-ethics.net. You can also follow us on Twitter, machine underscore ethics, Instagram, machine ethics podcast. And if you can, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you on. If you could uh, tell me pleasure. who you are and what do you do? I'm Mark Kuckelberg. I'm a professor here at the University of Vienna for philosophy of technology. And um, yeah, I think about the ethics of uh, digital technologies, especially ethics of AI and, uh, and ethics of robotics. Awesome. And the first question that we ask always in the podcast is, um, you talk about AI and robotics, but what are these things, right? What is AI and, and robotics? Yeah, I mean, uh, AI has a has a long history. Uh, there's different types of AI. I think what we are uh, today talking about when we talk about AI is usually machine learning. So if I will uh, mention AI, uh, I, I mean machine learning. Um, what, another point I make about that always is that AI is not like just this thing. Uh, first of all, because it's like um, you know part of bigger technical systems and infrastructures. Um, but also because for me, AI is not only um, a thing, but also a story. It's also something that people tell uh, about AI, about the future of machines. Um, people have all kind of imagine, you know, imaginations about that. So for me, AI is also that and, and is also interesting as a, as a more humanities kind of person to, to look what are the narratives about AI and, and how does it shape um, how we think about AI? The kind of idea of, um, or the changing idea of AI is a really interesting one as it pertains to, you know, it can almost be leveraged through our storytelling and, and science fiction and stuff like that. And then you start seeing things in film and you know, Black Mirror comes to mind as things which are very, very close to home depictions of things. Mm. Um, do you think that the way that we talk about AI is too far divorced from the, the, the reality, maybe? Is, you know... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I think that that we're, we're too much talking about science fiction often rather than reality in the sense that, you know, people talk about sentience, consciousness in relation to current AI. And I think that's that's really a mistake. Whatever you think about the future uh, of, of AI, I think it's a, it's a mistake to have discussions about that. It's not a mistake to use it to talk about, um, you know, what how we deal with moral status. I've done that in my work. I think it's philosophically interesting to ask questions like, yeah, you know, what for example, what do we mean by consciousness and how are we so sure that, you know, these and these properties lead to that and that moral status? Um, is that, could there be something wrong with us ascribing moral status to other things and to other beings? Um, could there be something wrong with the hierarchical position we take there? So I have all kinds of questions about that. Mm -hmm. But I think what should be avoided is, um, you know, claims that really... Um, see current AI in in science fiction terms. I think that's uh, that's not there. We don't have general AI. Uh, we don't have general artificial intelligence. Um, we, we don't have robots that are like humans or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And I guess there's a clear line between um, the old, old style robots, which maybe 
had less capacity to, to for the AI sort of side, and uh, right. and I guess they're coming further and further together at the moment. Where there's you know there's industrial robots, but there's also right. you know Hoovers and things in our homes and all sorts of things, right. um, companion robots uh, and all these sorts of different kinds of robots which are um, mm-hmm. becoming enabled or let's say smarter i'm doing inverted commas here smarter uh, yeah. through the the developments also happened in ai is that something that you are looking at in your work as well that is those kind of yeah. um how the the, the the physical reality of our situation is is beca- becoming yeah. more intelligent so when i started with with ethics of uh, robotics um quite a while ago um, there were these narratives around of robots entering the home and uh, of course, it, that is science fiction in the sense that we don't have these humanoid robots that you know uh, give us a beer, for example, right? So this is like a, one of the classic things, like uh, household robots in in that sense. I, I think that's not happening. But what is happening, uh, you know, during the past 10, 15 years is definitely that um, that there is robotic technology being used in home environments. Um, and this does change the perception of robots and automation a little bit, you know, because people get um, some experience with these machines, um, and and there there are real concrete ethical issues there. For example, something that not many people are looking at is uh, human ro- sorry um, robot animal relations. So most people are always working on on human robot relations. Um, but of course, we have pets in our homes, uh, and and these pets will somehow interact with the robots. Uh, how are we dealing with that? This is a very physical, material sort of thing. Um, and yeah, the same uh, we can think about. Uh, you know, given that energy is not uh, uh, limitless and uh, expensive these days. Um, so how, what does this mean for robotics? I mean, is this the end of the robotics revolution? It's also a question that I uh, would like to to, to ask. Yeah? Uh, well, all these automation technologies, all the digital technologies also, they use uh, energy, some a lot of energy, also AI, for example, right? So some models, uh, big models, training them is, is, is uh, costly in terms of energy. So. So how do we deal with that in the current situation, given climate change, given uh, economic crisis and so on? Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a material and, and physical side to robotics uh, and, and one that becomes more and more relevant as these technologies enter the home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really because I uh, it's really interesting because you never hear about people calling for the end of technology of the end of of this rapid um innovation or you know production of um information technologies right there's very little uh, appreciation for maybe a slowdown or a plateau of that stuff um mm-hmm. by guess given our environmental uh, predicament then there there must be something that has to happen there you know um Right, right. And, I, and you mentioned in your uh, your paper, um, which I looked at, about AI may be coming to help, but also being a contributor. Like, and you were talking about double-edged sword there. I, I mean, I, I am uh, optimistic that science and technology can help humanity, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not against that. Um, what I am against is is the idea that that you know against techno solutionism the the idea that that it's only science and technology that's going to save us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we definitely need to think more about like how to you know also um, change our culture and and political direction in in order to deal with these huge challenges also globally. Um, that being said, I think you know while these technologies can can help us. Um, often technologies are also part of the problem, and uh, you know, at, generally speaking, technologies, the development of technology, also has necessitated this sort of um, high-energy societies, right? Um, so if we didn't have all the 
all the machines. We also didn't need so much power. Mm. And um, yeah, what I find interesting is that these technologies that are called uh, digital technologies that, you know, we often think that they are very um, immaterial, that it's just about software, um, perhaps with a bit of hardware or something, but we, we often don't realize um, how these um, technologies are, are, are related to infrastructures, to natural resources, um, how these also, you know, take electricity. Electricity is itself also, of course, invisible. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things around all these smart technologies, this, this, this hip technologies that, that, yeah, that, that is maybe not so um, exciting, but of course, yeah, uh, is, is part of the problem. So I, I do think that if we go ahead with this technological revolution, uh, and probably we will do, but then then we really need to be very careful that um, yeah that it's smart also smart technologies in the sense of technologies that don't use so much energy, technologies that are not you know not directly connected to um, devices that are produced in a way that's not sustainable and in a way that's you know also not good for for um, human labor mm. uh, and, and problems around that. And is that, I mean, you've written, you've written quite a few books now. Is that something that you are going to do more work on um, in that area, um, as well as um, your latest book that's coming out on the politics of AI? That's right, yes. So, so my latest book is about uh, political philosophy of AI, and I'm, I'm continuing working on that. I'm currently working on the topic of democracy and AI, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's and and within that context, I think it's also good to address these problems around AI and climate change, especially. There are already some people working on uh, AI and sustainability. Very good work, mm -hmm. um, but but I, I want to focus on climate. Um, and um, yeah, of course. So so I'm I'm setting up um, new research on on this. And um, yeah, one paper that already came out of that was uh, like a very technical management kind of paper that tries to say like, okay, well, you know, one way of dealing with this at the level of organizations and, and the development of software is to, um, to give um, developers a sustainability budget mm -hmm. um, to say like, okay, you're, you're, we're not going to over-regulate you, but, but you just get a certain budget in a sense of um, a kind of allowance for having your technologies use energy and so on. Mm. Um, and you're going to decide how to creatively solve the problem also as a technical problem, how to, to make the, the technology more sustainable. Um, so I think we need to think of this problem at all kinds of levels, politically, uh, at, at the global level, uh, but also at the level of, of, of companies, for example, right, mm. that de de develop AI. And, and try to find ways you know, next to regulation also to, to encourage them, to incentivize them to, to develop sustainable and, and uh, climate-friendly AI. Yeah, and I guess in back to your point earlier is that AI could be a, a companion piece in making this more sustainable budget kind of loop happen um, using smart prediction or... Um, some of the statistical tools that we have to then maybe share that information around or better budget that in information that can be part of the, the equation sort of thing. Absolutely, AI and, and also software in general can help mm. there too, right? So I'm currently talking to um, people in the business world to try to, you know, have a, have a more, more practical solutions there to um to make sure that this is, doesn't remain just philosophical ideas but um also gets really implemented and and gets implemented also in a way that developers can work with right mm. so that it's not just um just not just ethics talk which is important and and which also can influence policy and regulation but but also um you know yeah more con concrete proposals i think can can do a lot of work there um, and it doesn't always have to be called ethics, but in mm -hmm. any case, it, it, it can help the uh, uh, also people in uh, in the technology and business world to do the, the good thing. 
Yeah, I mean, um, as a developer myself, I would imagine that you could go in and, you know, there's certain people you buy services from, right? And you could just have um, some figures and you're like, oh, I'm going to get this many people using this thing a day. Um, I want it to be this much bandwidth and, you know, the uptime to be great or whatever. And then there'll be like this, <laughs> you know, big red mark or like, actually, you probably want to go over here. Um, it's you know, slightly more efficient for you in your particular use case or whatever. Um, right. Yes. Like personalized in a way, right? I mean, you know, yeah. personalized in the sense of like adapted to the situation. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. I mean, that would be specific products. Yeah. No, make it super easy to make that choice um, make more sense in that in, in that for that uh, circumstance for those people. Um, yes. And less arguing. I, there's no arguing with like hard numbers. I think developers like hard numbers in that way as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we need a mix of of measures, and and mm. if the numbers can help, and if the technology can also help, uh, why why not? I mean, that, that's really, yeah. I think we need, we need to be pluralist in terms of methods to uh, you know for the cause of of ethics of AI. Yeah. So I actually um, heard about you originally from your 2020 AI ethics book. That book was the first book that I had found um, because I've got a big pile of books at home um, in this area that was explicit about AI and ethics. Um, and it wasn't beating around the bush. And um, I started the podcast in 2016. And this idea of AI ethics uh, kind of grew up over that time into a thing right so i think i saw your book as the first book to actually call out what everyone was saying was this new area of ai ethics um whereas beforehand you had all these different kind of um academic areas um people talking about robo ethics um the sociology and digital technologies and uh big data you know all these sorts of things um, but then your book kind of went, well, there's this thing called AI ethics and there's all this stuff there, um, which I found quite interesting. Um, and I grabbed it and I read it <laughs> and it's on my shelf. Um, how, how do you feel about you know, Why did you do that book? And mm -hmm. since then, how much has changed, do you think? Yeah, I think the, at, at the time when I wrote it, 2018, 2019, um, I think it was a good time to um, call attention to the ethics of AI. It, there, there was already uh, some work, uh, as you mentioned, um, also so work, for example, like more like principles uh, already a little bit and things like that. But I, I would say like it, the, the team itself wasn't that known yet among the general public. And um, among technical researchers, there was only a beginning awareness of the issue. Um, I think now that that really changed, I think um, not only that particular book, but also other books, um, also many policy, you know, work in policy has has created a situation where now there's there's a much broader awareness of the of the, of the issue. Um, I, I wrote it back then, I think, in a in a good time. Um, to to help to create that awareness, and I'm very happy that it has been um, instrumental um, for for that. Um, I think it's still doing good work for people who haven't heard about it too much. Um, also, technical people, also people in the business world. So um, you know, if it can do that, that that's great. Um, and I, I see today that um, you know, together with other people in the AI ethics community that, that now there is like, I would say it, it, it's more and more established fields of research academically. Um, the term is also quite well known. So yeah, and, and I think this is a good moment then to, yeah, to think more about this kind of practical solutions uh, because we have already a lot of policy documents. We have uh, some books that that call attention to this. So I, I think now is the time to to really do something about it, um, both at the political level, policy level, and at uh, at the technical level. Yeah. And um, 
I guess when you mean when you say do something about it, you mean there are some aspects which um, I I feel like are more or less solved in inverted commas like there are questions that we asked and and we have some answers we've looked into it we've done some research and there are more much kind of more open questions um around the um, the technology still um so i think there's this area which is one of those open questions still is around fairness and the kind of the use of technologies in this way as well as kind of more technical work still going on with explainable AI and, and some of those other aspects. Is that something that kind of rhymes true for you? Yeah, um, maybe the, the topic of explainability uh, is a good one here because um, you're right that there has already been, you know, already some work has been done. Um, for example, there has been really this technical work on explainability. At the same time, I think people sometimes forget that the topic is wider because one needs to also ask questions like what to really really mean by explanation, uh, more philosophical questions about that, also very political questions in the sense that, you know, explanation for whom exactly, uh, what do these people uh, require? What kind of explanation do they want uh, and do they deserve? Um, maybe they don't need this technical explanation, for example, but they need some other kind of explanation, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think there's uh, there's always these two sides. Um, and and I, I see the same thing now when I'm working on democracy and AI, for example, that there is uh, this, this technical people doing experiments about democracy and AI, where AI for example, designs uh, some kind of procedure. I think this is all great work, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a broader awareness of the, um, yeah, more, more philosophical um, depth to the problem and, and you know, the, the concepts that there are in philosophy also to think about is in that case, you know, political philosophy of a democracy. So I think what we need is of course both, right? So we, we need, uh, so it's not dismissing that work, but it's it's also calling attention, like in the, you know, uh, uh, nature article that I did with with some other people, like calling attention to like, okay, there, there's also resources from philosophy here that can be used and should be used, um, and um, yeah, I think that makes for a, a more a richer discussion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think. Uh, you know, obviously, um, from my point of view, like the the, the coming together of ethics um, and philosophy and design and technology are are the reason why I started this podcast. You know, and, and my general interest. Um, so I think across the board, AI ethics is that. You know, there's the quite a lot of questions which this also they just require those kind of two sets of thinking or. Um, myriad of, of, of poly thinking, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> multifaceted thinking um, around right. the, the projects and, and, and the the solutions. Um, you mentioned the the book having this positive impact and, and awareness um, driving thing. Um, what do you hope to get out of the process of this next uh, politically focused book? Is that something that you want to draw? Um, certain types of people in to the, to absolutely so um uh, apart from again you know also trying to address technical people and people from business i think here with this book, book in particular i would like to also appeal to policymakers um because i do think that they um are on a day-to-day -day basis struggling with this kind of you know political tensions um, that have to be dealt with somehow uh, when it comes to yeah uh, regulating AI when it comes to um, setting up also some ways of, of maybe making development of technology more democratic so I think there the, the book offers um, yeah instead of you know discussions from ethics like you know discussion about responsibility for example about justice and fairness uh, here, uh, justice refigures, but but there's also a lot of specifically political themes like liberty, discussions around power, uh, and and so on. And I think there that can appeal to both policymakers and also uh, citizens, mm -hmm. 
uh, and their organizations who are interested in, you know, what, what is the future of our democracies um, in the 21st century, given some political developments. You know, I see a lot of authoritarianism, for example, or tendencies towards that, but also, um, yeah, uh, these technologies, um, AI, um, automation technologies that seem to really change our societies and economies. And so um, what does then things like freedom mean? What what uh, does a principle like democracy, what, what does it mean really for um, a society that's, that's deeply pervaded by digital technologies, including AI? And are you hopeful or <laughs> a pessimistic? Uh, <laughs> Well, in, in, I think in the end, I, I am uh, hopeful, but I, I, of course, see it as my task to first be critical and do the analysis. And in my analysis, um, also in what I'm writing now about AI and democracy, I'm, I'm first, of course, yeah, calling attention to the uh, the, the less rosy effects, uh, the, the darker side mm. of um, AI and politics. Uh, and, and I think it's necessary to to warn people for this, right? Um, that if we, if we don't do anything, then then there could be, it could easily go in a more authoritarian, perhaps even totalitarian direction. And I would like to, uh, of course, like you know, as as I hope many uh, people in the audience want to avoid that. So so I first warn, but then I think that um, that in the end we we need to think more constructively about okay you know, these technologies are not going to go away. Um, and can we change them in such a way that, for example, problems about bias and justice are dealt with? Can we change them in a way that preserves liberty, um, rule of law, and so on? Um, and yeah, there, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, both academically and in, in practice, um, how to deal with this, what kind of different technologies do we need? Um, and in the end, probably also different institutions. Mm. Uh, I use the, the term political technologies to um, to indicate a direction in which we you know, recognize, acknowledge that technologies are not neutral, uh, that they're not politically neutral, that they really do something to our society, that they, they influence also, mm. shape these, um, you know, the realization of these important values such as freedom and justice and um yeah it w i think on the basis of recognizing this and recognizing the potential problems we can then say okay let's let's then you know um up front design these things in such a way that they you know positively contribute um if if they're not neutral then you know they should be they should help us to move in the right direction normatively speaking and I guess our task at that point is to be able to tell the difference or to try our very best to to create technologies which are in the direction of that uh, more positive outcome, uh, socially beneficial, uh, politically um, less uh, authoritarian um, situation that we we are curating our future in that aspect. That's right. I think it's that combination of, of, you know, shaping the technologies and also at the same time, of course, strengthening uh, democratic institutions, uh, thinking about how to change politics in such a way that, you know, so, so I think it's always humans and technology. And also in, the, in technology, there's, there's humans and there's humans that need to be held accountable and so on. So I think it's, it's, we have to work on, on both um in order to change things i was wondering if you have any um if you have any thoughts about going back to what we originally talked about and this more science fictiony future world and whether you have a particular um interest in the the, the proving out of consciousness in ai technologies and, and um I know we were kind of we skipped over that aspect earlier, um, but if you if you had any more to say there, um, slightly more um, maybe uh, fanciful than you know is is there some sort of solution to that uh, 
uh, understanding if, if something's conscious uh, or not. Um, these kind of more high level uh, philosophy ideas um, that we can utilize against um, AI or other things in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'm very skeptical of these science fiction scenarios that we will have super intelligent AI, and especially if that AI isn't supposed to take over or to uh, play a role in some kind of cosmic uh, narrative. Um, I, you know, I, I think that is the stuff of science fiction, and, and science, I'm not against science fiction, but it should be in, you know, remain in that section. Um, but what what we can do is to to think about, okay. You know what's the problem here? What's the challenge here? So what what we see is that machines get much better at imitating, uh, you know, being a conscious, a conscious, uh, sentient entity, mm-hmm. um, and that's something we should take seriously. Uh, so it, it's going to get better using machine learning and the most advanced technologies. And so what will happen is what we see also a bit in robotics, but much more. Uh, what will happen is that. Uh, that people will perceive some machines um, as having consciousness or as have, being more than a machine. Um, so when I'm against what I call this science fiction, you know, science fiction narrative, I don't want to dismiss those experiences. And I think we, we should think about, like, okay, is this what we want from machines? Is is this you know is this the game we should play or? Or is there is there another game we should uh, invest in, right? And and be busy with. I think the the game that tries to imitate humans is probably uh, not the most interesting game to play. We need to, um, yeah, think what what do we want to achieve with our uh, with all this advanced technology? What are the, the further goals? Uh, what is important, and that brings us again, of course, to ethics, to politics. Um, what do we as a society want from these machines? Mm. Um, of course, there will be always an entertainment ex- aspect, right? So there will be always the, like a magic show, uh, you know, like here's a, here's a robot and look what the robot can do. And, uh, you know, for, for a few minutes, we might be fooled uh, by, by that robot or by that uh, AI system you know that we might think like oh is this a human or not um but but i think in general we should think about okay l- let's use this great technology this machine learning um for for purposes that actually um help us um in, in solving societal problems in, in creating a better world so I think there's a question that I actually have asked a few times uh, over the last couple of years because of the um, new um, legislation and things coming in. Um, how do you feel about um, the legislation that we've had proposed so far? And again, it's it's for a reason, right? So it's it's to take some of that power or to, to be able to uh, limit the uses of this technology um, so that it has less negative outcomes um, on mass for people in, um, you know, in the European Union, for example. But um, there's, there's new coming, new legislation coming out in the U- US, um, and I've, I've had murmurings of the UK stuff as well. Um, so, how do you feel about that kind of whole over us situation? Yes, I mean, there's uh, of course most of my experience with. Uh policy advisors in uh, Europe and especially like at EU level um, in the high level expert group and then and also at national level um, I, I think what the EU is doing now is 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 very good thing because I think they've they've been in a way in the world pioneers in trying to regulate AI and they're further than, than many others um, but I'm also uh, you know happy to hear that, uh, that there are these uh, efforts also from the, the, the US government and so on. I, I think that it's a very good evolution. Of course, one can be critical of the um, you know, particular points. Um, for example, this high risk versus low risk distinction. I'm not sure if that always works, but um, yeah, in, in general, it's a very good direction. Mm. Um, However, there remains the problem that, you know, in spite of these efforts to regulate, 
which is the initiative of governments and supranational bodies like the EU. I, I think the yeah it remains a problem that that big tech, uh, you know, the big tech corporations in this of this world that they still have a, a lot of power, uh, often as compared also to um, to nation states um, when it comes to like you know shaping our lives, and, and I think that's that's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, uh, I know that in different political cultures, there are different ideas about how um, what the role of the state should be. Mm. And and I know, for example, in the U.S., there's a more, let's say, fair um, and self-regulation kind of culture. Um, th that's all fine and good, but uh, I think what you know, if you combine that culture with um, what is currently happening, you see that that the government has very little room to um, yeah to take influence on technology development, the, also the, the you know the way it's used. Um, so I think there we need to redress that balance. We need we need to think about how can um, yeah you know democratically elected people uh, have more influence on on our technological future. Um, if I see the current developments like Musk taking over Twitter and uh, you know just a few billionaires basically deciding how how we uh, live and communicate, I, I think this is something that that's a serious problem and that we need to deal with um, in you know in different ways in different political environments, uh, but also partially globally. I, th I think that the need, something needs to be done because otherwise we're, we're going to have a serious uh, democratic deficit also in the future. And um, I think we can't afford that. I think we can't afford it that just some people um, decide about about that future. Mm, I've got a theory, right? <laughs> right. Um, and my theory goes that the the governments of this world are hampered by their locales, right? Whereas the the corporates are global. So the, the, the main uh, for me the, the most obvious issue is that you can as a company you could set up and put together i mean you might hit against governmental issues like in china where you know google and historically have had issues there um you might hit up against certain judiciaries um not taking you on board but generally you can go into do different geolocations and kind of spread using that network effect and and do this you know whatever the service is and, and build upon that in a way that uh governments are unable to do and it'd be interesting if governments in whatever form could do something like that but i mean you could look at maybe the un or something like that um or some other entity you could then have the reach that is required um for this kind of global connected world that we live in um i mean i'm that's, that's just like literally um spitballing from my brain right then but <laughs> yeah, yeah. no no that, i think that's 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 really going in the right direction what what you said because i mean i've been arguing for a more global approach to governance of ai governance of climate change also i think it's um is the only way to go and and uh, one problem we have in the current world is that um, nationalism is sort of uh, very uh, popular ideology, unfortunately, because I think it it yeah it hampers the um, setting up of of institutions that are not just international but also supranational. Because if if you're yeah if you keep the all the power with the different member states, mm -hmm. um, you're never going to be able to to really um, have a proper global governance of global problems. I I think it's it's a very simple principle. I think the you know the level of the problem should uh, be matched by the level of governance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the levels we need uh, more governance. Um, I'm I'm you know I'm very happy with efforts by UNESCO, Council of Europe, um, other international organizations to try to. Um, 
yeah, make some recommendations, uh, have some kind of frameworks. But um, of course, these these are not very effective because they're not um, yeah they're not compulsory. They're not uh, they're not really transformed into law. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we need some systemic changes at global level there. Um, of course, changes that should be as democratic as possible, uh, because that's a, that's a worry, uh, and, and we have, people are right to worry about that. We don't want a, a world government according to you know the model of um, say an authoritarian nation state. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, we, what we do want is uh, is is a stronger supranational institution that can uh, deal with uh, the challenges. And and it's not only AI; it's also, as I said, climate change. It's also pandemics. It's also war. Uh, there's there's lots of problems that don't get solved because of this limitation. Um, that, you know, we keep believing in nationalism and uh, keep believing in, in you know that that's the uh, the level of the main level of politics. Uh, so I think that there we we need to really make uh, a lot of progress if we want to deal with these these problems properly. Um, so we'll we'll go and do that then. All right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. <laughs> bye bye. That's got my afternoon blocked out. Um, All right. <laughs> sort that one out. Um, it, it's a real pleasure talking to you, Mark. Um, the, la- the last couple of things that we usually ask are around things that you may have uh, spoken about already um, to do with what really excites you with AI and robotics in our future and some of the things that really scare you about that situation as well. I think we, what excites me is that, um, yeah, we, we finally have... Um, tools that are better suited to the complexity of the societies that we've built. Um, and so we can, um, I think for science, both natural sciences and social sciences, um, yeah, we, we, we can do a lot more. We can get better insights in the, the patterns uh, that, that are um, present in, in what's happening. So I, I think it's one really powerful tool that we have um i think there's a lot of cool things happening also in in art in uh, language uh, natural language processing and everything um i think it's exciting developments that just like other digital technologies help us to um expand um you know the expand intelligence expand our cognitive capacities um i think that's all great um, what, what I'm really afraid of is that that these technologies will be combined with the worst of uh, human uh, tendencies and, and uh, risks, and you know politically that is I think authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Um, and so if 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 that combination happens, then then I'm really worried because then we have these powerful tools in the hands of um of that kind of regimes um and and the kind of people who also want to turn our liberal democracies in in into uh, that kind of systems so that that i'm really worried about and i but i think we don't need to um we don't need to be hopeless or desperate about this and just you know work towards uh, strengthening our democracies and also um making sure that um, the, the technologies like AI and robotics we develop, um, yeah, are developed in a way that's that's both ethically and politically sustainable. Um, so thanks very much for your time, Mark. Real pleasure, and um, all the best with your new book. Uh, people should check it out. And if people want to follow you, find out about you, how can they do that? They can follow me on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Mastodon, LinkedIn. Uh, and I have a website on WordPress, kukelberg.wordpress.com, uh, where they can also follow my uh, recent books and uh, all that. Cool. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hi, and welcome to the end of the podcast. 
Thanks again to Mark for joining us. It was a really real pleasure to have Mark on the show as I read some of his books and papers. So it was really great to have him on the show to talk about some of those things and ask him directly some of those questions I've been dying to ask. I'm really pleased at the end there, Mark picked up on my kind of flight of fancy, the global governance uh, for global issues. So that was really uh, pleasant for me um, to get a confirmation of you know, good ideas, uh, things like that. I also really enjoyed um, his ideas around energy budgets and environmental ideas, which we can kind of put in practice today. Some things which are just kind of things that we could do, which didn't really need much research. Let's just get on and do it. I'm also really looking forward to picking up a copy of his new book, The Politics of AI, and hopefully doing a review of that on the Patreon in future. So if you can check it out, it's patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time.